Okay, my wonderful students, uh, let's begin lecture for today. Uh, we're going to be, uh, by the end of lecture today, we'll be dipping into chapter 7, some of the basic oscillation concepts. But our main topic for today is uh, thermal equilibrium and how to calculate the equilibrium temperature, or one way to calculate the equilibrium temperature um, for two substances at starting at different temperatures and uh, diff different substances, different specific heat and different mass. Now, I want to uh, just do a little quick review of where we finished last time. Uh, we were talking about heat transport, the three different modes. Uh, conduction, uh, which we consider to proceed through thermal contact of two substances. Usually that means physical contact. Um, like, for instance, you know, putting, your, putting an ice cube in your hand. You take it out of the fridge and it's now on your hand which is 98.6 Fahrenheit so it's going to start to um, heat up your hand is going to feel colder and the ice cube is going to feel warmer and it's going to start to melt uh, so that's an example of conduction we talked about convection the bulk motion because of the buoyancy of usually stuff that's hotter is more buoyant although it depends on the substance uh, but uh, frequently, uh, you'll get convection, uh, the bulk motion, like a hot air balloon. That's a convection system. Thunderstorms, convection systems. Hurricanes, gigantically organized convection systems. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, vertical motion through the buoyancy of uh, warm bulks of, um, of gas, mainly. And we talked uh, last time about radiation as a transport mechanism, a transport mode, um, because photon by photon, every photon that's absorbed anyways, uh, will transfer some momentum and energy to a given substance. Now, if it's transparent, it zips right through. And there's nothing that's perfectly transparent except the vacuum. You know, like glass, you know, you can, you know, like in a window in your car, you can see through it. It's pretty transparent, but it's not perfectly transparent because if it, you know, if you get in your car, at, you know, at 7 a.m. today when it's dark, the sun's not up quite up yet. Um, you, the glass is cold to the touch, but you go out there if, if you're parked in a surface parking lot at lunchtime, you know, with the, the sun streaming down on it, that glass is going to be pretty hot. Because it does absorb a little bit, you know, even though most of it does go through. And we talked about the um, uh, radiative heat transfer, for instance, for space flight and the space program. And those guys have to carefully manage, um, f for instance, solar heat gain and uh, the cool down. You know, if you're, if you're all back on the, the, sh the dark side of the moon, away from the SUN, or if you're a spacecraft orbiting Earth, you know, half your time, if you're on a circular orbit anyways, you're going to be around the dark side of the Earth, you know, wherever it's night on Earth. Did you ever figure that out? It's always nighttime somewhere on Earth, just as it's always noon somewhere. Matter of fact, it's noon, it's lunchtime in London, England right now. And so that means that on the other side, of the, so over in Alaska uh, and like Tahiti and stuff on the international date line, it's about midnight, early morning or 11 p.m. or so. And uh, let's see, in Japan, it would be late at night, November 2nd, I guess. Is that right? No, it'd be late at night, November 1st in Japan. Anyways, so, the, so a space capsule orbiting Earth or orbiting the moon, you know, like Apollo, they did that, you know, 
a few swings around the moon up there. The dark side, they're going to be losing a lot of heat. And, you know, out there in empty space, if you're not in the S-U-N, if you're not in the sunlight, uh, you know, you're going to freeze your burp off. And so they got to they got to deal with it. You know, so uh, positive delta Q. Make sure you write that down. Delta Q greater than zero. That means positive. Um, and that's for when they're out in the sunlight. You know, so when they're when they're, you know, like when the Apollo astronauts are coasting, they leave Earth orbit and they head for the moon. But before they get to the moon, you know, they're out there in the middle of, you know, 240,000 miles to go. And they're, they're, they take several, they take, I think, a, a day or two to get all the way to the moon. They're out there in the sun, so they got to really manage their heat um, out there. And an ex example of that is on the Apollo mission, they did something called, you know, when they got out of Earth orbit, you know, so they're no, no longer going day, night, day, night, day, night, as they orbit the Earth every 45 minutes. Um, they had to do the barbecue roll. And all that is, is that they start, you know, they aim the, the capsule, the command module, towards the moon or towards where they're, you know, heading. And then they give it a little bit of a spin, one revolution every uh, 10 minutes, I think. They're very slow. Now, other systems like this rooftop heat collector for your hot water system, you don't want to defeat solar heat gain. You want every single photon that you can get. All right. So it's made with shiny metal to reflect sunlight and transparent plastic or glass, I guess, uh, to you know permit as much sunlight to touch the water in that water supply. Now. Uh, we talked about all that last time. In the meantime, since Tuesday, I looked up the barbecue roll. Now, here's, a, here's some notes from the space pro, from the guys up at MIT that had to help NASA figure out, okay, how are we going to manage this heat? So they came up with the barbecue roll. And so you can see here, dynamics challenge requirement for long periods of coasting flight provide passive thermal control by implementing a barbecue mode a very slow rotation one revolution uh, per 10 minutes or slower about the spacecraft roll axis so the central axis of the spacecraft and with the desired roll axis direction fixed in space so you can see they got some diagrams here's some of the equations uh, Look at that set of equations. Now, don't bother writing those down. That's a, that's a ton of calculus and trig and matrices and stuff. But look at, let's just focus in on this one thing right here. Moment of inertia. And those, see, kilogram meter squared for moment of inertia. And here's the, here's the kicker for the Apollo command module. It's not perfectly symmetric. So they don't have one fixed uh, moment of inertia. They actually have nine that, you know, they have to, you know, factor in the, the fact that, you know, the X, Y direction, the, or the X axis direction, and the Y axis direction, and the Z axis direction, things are not distributed perfectly in the spacecraft. You know, they got something heavy over here on the left side of the cabin, and it's not matched by something. Now, they want to get it as close as they can, but it's not perfect. And so you can see that they've got, but, you know, they're dealing with inertia and torques, stuff. We already did. We, you know, it's a bunch of MR squareds up here. And if you think about it, you know, for, a, for a, something extremely complicated like the command module of the... Uh, of the, of the Apollo mission, oh my goodness. You know, you can figure, it takes, it must have taken a month of Sundays to figure out MR squared for every single gram of metal, plastic, glass. And of course, that's just the spacecraft. If the astronauts move from point A to point B inside, you know, then that changes the spin uh, that changes the MR, the sum of all your MR squares. But yeah, we, so, 
So yeah, you guys could probably get a job down there at Houston, you know, working on one half MR squared and stuff like that, maybe. But you can see these guys have, are doing that. And this is from MIT. They're backing up the mission control guys in Houston. Now, we, we finished up talking about SR-71 Blackbird, you know, the, the plane that is so amazing and, it, it, you know, it, it goes so fast. It's not published. It's top secret, even today, uh, how fast it can go top speed. But it does get red hot. Everybody knows that. And so we want to talk about some of the basic things about um, heating stuff up. And we, we talked about this last time as well, the basic concepts. And this is going to launch us into some clicker questions. So have your clicker ready. All right. And, uh, oh, by the way, before I go further, uh, and I know you're jotting down some notes here, uh, I published another clicking roundup yesterday. So now, as of Tuesday, we're 50-50. Okay, so if you have, let's see, 42.5 questions. So if you have 43 questions answered or more from your roundup figure, that's the decimal part. Uh, ding, 25 out of 25. If you have 37.5 questions, so round it up to 38. If you have 38 or more for bonus points, but you don't get those un until the end of the semester, if you keep it above 75%, correct. So uh, that's up. And I, I, de uh, I unpublished all the ones from two weeks ago. But, you know, the, the, the main thing that you can't calculate uh, easily is the clicker pointage. Uh, and I published that yesterday. There are the clicker scores. Uh, so two objects are, in, um, are out of equilibrium if they have different temperatures. Okay, so substance X, substance Y, substance y kind, of, kind of a generic schematic diagram, two blobs. If temperature Y is larger than temperature X, then heat will flow from the hot one, out of the hot one, into the cool one. Now that's the, that's a law of thermodynamics. You know, hot stuff cools off, and as it does so, it warms up stuff that's cooler. And it's because of the mole, you know, we, we think basically it's because of the molecules. And it's kind of interesting to think, so here's the, here's the big blob of kinetic energy and momentum swapping over to substance X from Y. And, you know, at substance X is transporting some kinetic, but it's slower on average because it's lower temperature, so it's kind of pokey. But eventually, you know, they get to the point where the averages are the same, and so then you can eventually, at this point, when they're swapping equal amounts of kinetic energy left to right from X to Y and from Y to X, then you have thermal equilibrium and the temperatures are the same. So those these arrows that I've just diagrammed out for you represent the average kinetic energy and the effect of it. A lot of it, you know, high average kinetic energy means you got a lot of it going over to the cool stuff. But here at equilibrium, you got stuff going from X, and you got just about the same amount of energy going over to Y, so you call it equilibrium. Uh, and that's basically the definition of thermal equilibrium. Now, we define it operationally in terms of the temperature, and it's on the Kelvin scale. All right, so if the Kelvin scale temperatures are the same, they're positive, and they correspond to the same average kinetic energy. For the, for the atoms or molecules of either substance, all right? Now, they're still different substances, and they may have a different mass, but kinetic energy-wise, yeah, same. Now, um, here's, uh, we're going to get to the new stuff now, um, and go ahead and draw yourself a sketch of this. This is from Homework 16. And what we did on number five in uh, homework 16, Connor, is we did the very first decision that you would have to make 
in order to calculate the thermal equilibrium temperature. You know, we started off with two substances, J and U, at different temperatures and also different masses. And, you know, in order to calculate the thermal equilibrium temperature, where they, you know, so one of them's starting up here and one of them's starting down here, and eventually they'll exchange energy and they'll get closer and closer. And somewhere between the high temperature and the low temperature, they're going to be at the same temperature, and then, then the temperature stop changing. If it's insulated, now if you take away the styrofoam insulation and you let it sit in the sunlight, then everything will heat up a little bit more. And so you'll get a little bit of, you know, maybe some convection in there or something like that. But, but if it's insulated and stuff, the only thing that can happen is energy can move from the hot stuff to the cooler stuff until they equilibrate. All right, so what, that, so what we're going to do is we're going to review some of the concepts from, uh, 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 you know, a, a pair of substances like number five in homework 16, and then we're going to take it all the way to the thermal equilibrium. And we're going to do that on the document camera using talk, the talking PDF uh, equipment. All right, but before we do that, we're going to do some clicker questions. And I want you to consider each of these clicker questions to be notes. So don't just click, write it down in your notes. All right, now it's going to be in the YouTube, so if you, if you boop it up, uh, and you miss something in, in your notes as we go, that's all right. You can refer back to YouTube, um, you know, sometime this afternoon. All right, but each of these brings out a concept that we want to keep in mind when we go and do the calculation on the document camera all the way to thermal equilibrium. First, you have 100 grams of both substances. All right, read carefully, take notes. So this is kind of a true or false. You know, two, two options. Let me grade this. Okay. And yeah, make sure you jot down the specific heat for J, 0 0.84 calories per gram Kelvin, because we're going to be doing that when we get to the dot cam. And for substance U, it's 0 0.56 calories per gram Kelvin. And there's my kind of schematic diagram of thermal contact, the two substances. You know, I had that picture of the beaker, you know, before, and this one's a little simpler. Okay. All right, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Come on. 4, there we go. 3, 2, 1, 0. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, um, they are not in thermal equilibrium because one of them's at 500, one of them's at 300, okay? So let's go to the next concept. Same thing, you have the, the, the pre, preamble up at the top is the same for both of these, for all, all the next few questions, Okay. They're in thermal contact. Uh, now we have to decide which one cools down and which one, or do they both cool down? Or do they both warm up? Right, so read carefully and make this part of your notes. This is a decision that you've got to work out in your mind when you're doing a thermal equilibrium ca calculation, Danielle. You kind of have to think, all right, which one's cooling off and which one's warming up? All right, you got to work that out in your mind. And then you'll be able to kind of navigate your way conceptually all the way through uh, to the thermal equilibrium temperature. Now, I know the answer, and you guys are doing good on this. Uh, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Zero. 
Uh, and you know what, you guys? Make sure you take a note about what the question is here. You know, make sure you write down the correct answer, uh, which is substance J cools down. Because that's the hot one. All right? And if it's in... Moscovitz dermatology. Ooh-ooh. I got to go to the doctor tomorrow. Get my head examined. Um, so yeah, so the the, cool, the hot one is going to cool down, and it's going to exchange energy with the cool one, and the cool so the cool one's going to warm up, and so you you have to figure this out before you, you know, because you don't want to you don't want to you know you're you're trying to figure out the change in the temperature when you're doing a thermal equilibrium calculation. So you don't want to figure out delta T and make it a positive delta T for something that's cooling down. For something that's cooling down, you're looking for negatory delta Ts. Okay, so you got to keep that in mind. All right, next question. You have 100 grams, blah, blah, blah. Uh, all right, Kelvin for Kelvin. Which is easier to cool down? Let me start this one, okay? Now it's a hundred grams of each, but they have different specific heat. They start with temperature, different temperatures. But this is like asking uh, Naya, you know, how, you know, if you go down one Kelvin, which one requires more energy to lose and which one to warm up by one Kelvin, which one requires more energy to go up? If it's, if it's that one. So yeah, you kind of have to work this out in your mind as well. Okay, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, 72 people answered. And you know what? Let's take a look at this. Make sure you make a, a note. This is getting closer and closer to the key item for us. J is harder to cool down by a Kelvin than it is to, you know, so J is going to cool down. We already decided that in the previous question, Casey. All right. And U is going to warm up, right? So is it, to, to dip it down by one Kelvin, is it, more energy for substance J to dip by one? Or is it more Kelvin? You know, so does it have to lose more than substance U has to gain? So, you know, one Kelvin for substance U up, is that more calories? And the answer to that is no. And, this, and you know what tells you that? The specific heat. Okay? And this is like... The way that I introduced the um, concept of specific heat, you know, which is easier to heat, heat up gram for gram, Kelvin for Kelvin. And that's how I phrased this one, except for the fact I didn't say gram for gram, but I set both with the same mass. So it actually is, you know, 100 grams for 100 grams, you know, and Kelvin for Kelvin. All right. So now this is important. All right, which one requires more energy? Uh, and it's J. J, you know, requires more energy per Kelvin to dip downward, to cool off. In other words, it's got to lose. So, so now here's something to think about, and you can make this a side note to this question. If, if substance J dips down by a Kelvin, all that energy goes into substance U in our setup, you know, insulated and so forth. It doesn't go anywhere else. So substance U 
So here's a mental IQ test question. You know, substance J goes down by a Kelvin. That energy goes into substance U. Does substance U go up by a Kelvin, less than a Kelvin, or more than a Kelvin? It does go up by more because it's easier to heat up. It doesn't need 0.84 for every gram. It only needs 0.56. You know, so if you if 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 substance J dips down by a Kelvin, substance U is going to dip upward by a, you know like 1.3 or whatever it works out to be. I mean, you could do Q equals M C delta T, and that's what we're about to do in the next question. Question four. Uh oh. You know what? You guys are very honest. I didn't close that question. Nobody changed their answer. Anyway, here's question number four. You have 100 grams now. Same preamble, except now I say, let's exchange 100 calories. All right? Now, that's the Q. So you got plus or minus Qs. Minus 100 calories for substance J, plus 100 calories gained by substance U. So, you know, so you can figure out MC delta T. You know the mass. You know C. You can figure out delta T. And this is the crux of our thermal equilibrium calculation. So think about this one really carefully. You know, 100 calories, you know, that's going to dip substance J. Your substance J loses 100. It dips by a certain temperature. And that 100 calories goes into substance U. So substance U responds by going up. In temperature. So does substance J dip more than U rises, or is it the other way around? And definitely talk it over with your neighbors. If you're in this class and you're not sitting with somebody that you can talk to, you're... Talking to somebody is always helpful. Especially if you're trying to, you know, savvy something for the first time. Okay, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Um, yeah, the majority of you answered this one correctly. Substance J loses 100 Kelvin, so, and we could figure out, or excuse me, it loses 100 calories. So we could figure out the delta T for substance J, all right? And then, you know, you can do Q equals MC delta T for substance U, because it's warming up. So you give it 100 calories equals MC delta T and figure out what delta T is for it. And what you'll find is that MC delta T and you could even calculate it. You know, I could make, you know, I should have made that the next question. What is the delta T for substance J? It's going to be negative something. What is the delta T for substance U? It's going to be positive something. You know, and what you're going to find is that substance U is going to change upward more than J changes downward. 
Now what that tells you is that on your way, now, and this is the last concept that we need to go to figure out a thermal equilibrium temperature. Let me ask you this. The equilibrium temperature, it's going to be somewhere between 300 and 500 Kelvin, right? Because, you know, it's not going to be above 500. It's not going to be below. So somewhere in between. But is it going to be 400? Is it going to be halfway? If you were mixing water and water or substance J with substance J, yeah, it would be. Equal masses, two different temperatures. Same substance. We got different substances. So now you got to think to yourself, you know, you're doing your thermal energy calculation and it's got to make sense to you. So what makes sense? Is the equilibrium temperature above 400 or below 400? Is it closer to 500 or is it closer to 300? Closer to 500 because substance J is kind of holding up the process. It's dipping, but not as much. So, so substance U is doing the bulk of the delta T's. You know, delta, substance J, is, it's, it's getting some good negatory delta T's, but not, nothing like substance U. Okay, substance U is doing much better because it's easier to heat up. Gram for gram, Kelvin for Kelvin. All right, now we're going to make use of that in the document cam. So let's just review and get everything set up. Uh, thermal equilibrium by conduction. Um, and we're going to, so substance is U and J, different temperatures. So we're going to start out of equilibrium. And what we're going to do is also use different masses, because that's what the homework problem had. I think we had 120 uh, grams for substance U and 200 grams for substance J. So that's what we're going to do. So there's a lot to keep track of in this calculation, but we're going to do it right now. And it's probably going to take a couple pages on the um, talking PDF, but I'll post the PDF um, in, uh, you know, later this afternoon. So you'll all have, so take good notes now. Podcast. Okay. We just have a few more minutes. Um, and so let me just, uh, point this out to you that we'll, um, I'll have a talking PD and actually you'll be able to see this talking PDF, the one that I just recorded and you'll you actually be able to see the other classes, but we're going to do the same calculation for the, uh, 1030 section. Question? Diamond, what do you think? Looking good? You kind of understand what's happening back there? Kind of, maybe, a little bit? Sort of? Okay. All right. Now, I want to um, draw your attention to... Actually, you know what? It's Thursday, right? Plus, last night was Halloween. So how about if we dismiss early? But you're going to have homework. Oh, also, wait a minute before you go. Um, you're going to have homework, uh, homework 17, with some of these thermal equilibrium calculations. And you're going to, I'm going to try to activate the Chapter 6 mini review sometime this weekend. So look for two, and I'll announce it in web courses. Okay, you're dismissed.